Okay, good to see you again. Um, good to be back after a couple of weeks away. <clears throat> It, um, it always does my heart good to see everybody talking and visiting and, and um, so glad that you're here in the body of Christ and able to, to encourage each other as we um, go through challenging things together. It's good to know that Christ had a thing called the church that does that kind of thing, that's uh, the kind of people that we laugh and we smile when everybody else is and then we cry if we need to when everybody else is and we go through a lot of things together and that's God's intent for the church to be there for each other and so I'm glad that so many of you feel that way if um, if you don't feel that way we're sorry we want to embrace you if we're allowed to embrace you and um, and just be your family so uh, thank you for being here and being Christ's family. I uh, know this exciting week for a lot of the kids uh, and a lot of the teachers and a lot of the parents and a lot of the grandparents. And so this is uh, one of those things that we're glad that we can go back to school this fall. Can I get a Oh, yeah. Things are a little different than last fall, thank the Lord. And we're going to give it a shot to do the best we can to, uh, to have some type of... Um, congruency in our education system so um, I hope that we can do, do that in the public school system but also in, in in our system here in our church system uh, the things that we do they all have a purpose and I know when we raise our voices to God in praise that that has a purpose uh, actually a couple of them. one it's showing praise and thankfulness to God but number two it puts him in the right place for the week ahead to, to say, you know what, we're going to rely on God as our creator, as the one that made us, the one that formed us, the one that has his idea of what our life should look like. We're going to raise him up on a, on a platform and say, you are our God. And our praise to him does that for us because we realize our God takes care of us. Through it all, he will. Um, I, I want you to turn to this passage, if you will. It's, it's up on the screen. We're going to read a little bit about that, um, that message that Paul had for Timothy. A young man before he was going to be really on his own for a while. And uh, Paul says some pretty incredible words, not only to the individual Timothy, uh, but then to the church <clears throat> following that. And uh, so I want to say the same thing to you all today. Um, having been gone the last couple of weeks, it's, uh, it's really good to, um, to know that there were people here praying for us as we spent a couple of weeks in South Dakota. And then there are people there that are praying for you, that the strength of God might be yours, that you'll um, come out of whatever challenges we have with, uh, with faith made stronger because we have each other, because we have a God that cares. As Timothy was going off to begin his ministry, Paul said these words to him. And I want to start in chapter 4 and in verse 6. He says, If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ. Christ Jesus, that is. Being trained in the words of of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths rather train yourself for godliness for while bodily training is of some value godliness is a value in every way as it holds promise for the per, for the present life and also for the life to come the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance for do this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Verse 11, command and teach these things. And verse 12, let no one despise you for your youth, 
but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourselves to the public reading of Scripture and to ex- exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by the prophet when uh, the council of elders, elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on your teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And I wanted to focus just for a little bit on that passage right there. Don't let anyone, Paul says to Timothy, look down on you because you're young. But be an example in speech, life, love, faith, and purity. Different versions have different words. Speech and what you say. In life, how you live. In love, how you embrace God and embrace others with your affection. In your faith, demonstrate clearly what your faith leads you to do in each and every day. And in purity, not just purity of body, but purity of mind, purity of soul. But Paul does not say, just survive another year. That's not what he says. And right now, I know a lot of people are saying, if we can just survive another year, it's going to be different, it's going to be weird, it's going to be chaotic for some of us. But if I can just survive, I used to be one when somebody said, Jerry, how are you doing? I would say, well, I'm surviving. Have you ever felt that way? You're just surviving, you're just trying to stand up under the pressures of what all's coming your way. How are you doing? You just survive. And that's not what Paul says to Timothy. Paul says something totally different. He says, set an example, be an example. You are called to a higher calling than just to survive, church. Now, I'm not just talking to the kids today or to the teachers or all of us who are not as young as perhaps Timothy was. We are called to be people that set an example in speech, life, love, faith, and purity. I got to tell you a story. And, and. I'm sorry I'm going to take a little bit of time to to tell this story um, because it changed my life and uh, it may influence yours, hopefully for the good. So here it is. I was uh, a teenage kid one time, you know, 10 or so years ago. And, um, okay, 40 or so years ago. And um, my parents were moving as a preacher my father moved about every three or four years because he would run out of sermons right Arliss that's what happens Uh, actually what happens is he usually starts preaching things that people need to hear because he knows his audience better and then because he teaches what they need to hear they don't like it and so then they fire him so that's my dad's story Um, so before my junior year we moved from Tahlequah Oklahoma to the paradise of Graham, Texas. Graham, Texas, west of Fort Worth. And if it's west of Fort Worth, it's not worth much. Have you heard that before? Graham, Texas. I didn't have any friends there. My parents didn't want to uproot me. I had a pretty good group of of, uh, Christian friends up in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. But I, I was willing to give it a shot. Dad interviewed. On the second interview, He took me down with him, and I got to hang around with one of the elders' kids. Now, what's interesting is you don't want to hang around with a lot of the elders' kids, um, but that's what happened that that evening. It was a Friday evening or Saturday evening, I believe it was Saturday, and um, one of the elders' kids said, jump in the car with me. We're going to go downtown where all the kids hang out from school while Dad talks to the elders. That's great. I'll go. And so we pull up into the city square, and it's much like the one here, uh, except that uh, it was packed with high school kids and their cars and their pickup trucks, people sitting on the tailgates, things like that, and, and just talking and having a really good time. 
we pulled up, pulled in the middle. Actually, it was a middle area you could park. And the first thing that happened was we rolled the windows down. And a fella, a high school kid, leans in and looks across me to the elder's kid and said, Hey, Johnny, that's not his name, um, you want a beer? And he kind of looked down and he said, No, I'm with the preacher's son here. I better, you know, no, 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 I don't want any of that. You could tell it was an uncomfortable position that he was in. And me. But something had happened just before that that... that made me know how to respond to this you see I knew that when I moved to a new place nobody knew me I knew that that I could be whatever I wanted to be they didn't have my history they didn't have the good guy or the not so good guy that I was but I could be God's guy brand new brand spanking new no history how many of you ever want to do that kind of thing And I said, I could be a football star. I could be, uh, I could be, you know, the the quarterback of the football team. Okay, that was that was a long shot. Uh, Okay, that was a really long shot. Okay, that was an impossibility. Let's go there. I could be a drama guy. I could be in all the school plays. I could be a a geeky nerdy guy that just studied all the time and then you know hired everybody else when I was older. Um, I could be that. I could be whatever I wanted, but I decided to be one thing. I decided to be, as a 16-year-old, I decided to be God's guy. Whatever that meant. Now I was kind of that before, but I I wasn't always as dedicated to that as I was going to be at this new place. And so when that friend reached in the window and offered a drink to my new friend, um, I knew my response because I'm God's guy. The problem with that was this is where all the kids were going to hang out every Saturday night. And I wanted to get to know some of these friends. I, over the course of the few weeks after that, met a couple guys at church that typically went down there and hung out with all the other guys at school that were doing whatever that brings. It wasn't a very healthy spiritual place to go. So I had an old 65 Chevy pickup truck. It had bullet holes in it. It had rust. It had pieces of it falling off. You know, most of us had those $200 pickup trucks when we were young. And I put some glass packs on it so that it would sound good, even though it looked like terrible things were about to happen. And they did. Um, I said to a couple of my buddies from church, I said, let's go down there this Saturday night. and, And let's not go to the square I noticed that across the street, kind of on the corner, was an empty lot. I said, let's go over there and park our trucks and play some Frisbee and just have a good time over there. Because we don't want to be a part of this, but we want to, you know, at least see some of our friends. But there's one law, one rule. No alcohol on this side. We went down that Saturday night. We had a ball, we played frisbee, we did other stuff. It was just a great time. A couple of our friends came over and, and they started having a good time with us. We're sitting and visiting. And, um, and then one of the girls that happened to be in the more accepted crowd came over. One of the guys was kind of interested in her and she came over and she had a glass full of stuff, a, a big cup full of stuff. And it was Dr. Pepper. And something else that smelled inappropriate for our side of the street. And so she said hello, and she started to hand me that. And I said, wait a minute, we've got one law and none of that. And as she tried to hand it to me, I intentionally dropped it, and it splattered everywhere. Well, she was angry. I think it cost her some money or something. And, and she got mad, and she stormed off and went back over to the square But an interesting thing happened. Three or four of the people that she told her story to, how he dropped that, and there was no... Three or four of her friends came over and started hanging out with us. And then our number grew from five to seven to 15 
to 20 to 40, all of these kids were gravitating to what we were now calling the dry side. We didn't know it, but there were a lot of kids over there that felt uncomfortable with what was going on and the things that were, they were drinking and saying and laughing about, and they one at a time gravitated over to the dry side. We were no heroes. We, we were no superhuman guys that made this stance that everybody has got to comply to. No. We were just guys that said, we're going to be God's guys and let the chips fall where they may. It's interesting as I look back, I see some of those that gathered up on the dry side going to Christian colleges with me and some to other Christian colleges. And I see them today still raising godly kids and and now grandkids and they're still my close deep friendships that I treasure all because of what happened on the dry side. But really, it was what happened right before that. We made up our minds, the three of us, to be God's guys. It just takes that one little step, young people, to say, I belong to God first before anything else. I'm dedicating my life to God because he's told me, he's the one that created me. He's told me the best way to live, and it is the best way to live, just living the way he wants you to live, demonstrated by Christ. And in doing so, we are told we can be saved, and we might save others too. In the passage we just read, did you find that, did you pick that up? Paul said, Timothy, be an example in speech, in life, in love, in faith, in purity. And in doing so, you will save yourself and to save those with whom you come in contact. That is the message today, not just for our kids, but for the adults in the room. We will never outgrow the need to be an example in our community, in our families, in our church. To be an example. Don't just survive. Don't just get through it. But be an example. Set an example in speech. Did I just step on some toes? In life. How you live your life. Love. Do you love the way that God loves people? In faith. Do you demonstrate your faith with every step that you take? I have faith in God. I'm doing things his way. And in purity. Purity of mind. Purity of body. Purity of eyes. Purity of speech, and that brings us all the way back to what do we say. I have a couple more slides for you today, but we're going to stop right there. Paul says, if you get this down, you get this down, you're going to make a difference. We, as the League Street Church of Christ, are going to make a difference a difference in 2022. As we approach that, and it's not far away, we're going to be having a concerted effort for us all to be a part of the kingdom movement that says we are God's people. We are God's guys and God's girls, and we are going to say things and do things and show things that are just all about God in order that we might save ourselves and that we might save others.
And we're going to ask every one of you to commit to first being God's guys and God's girls. And then we're going to let the chips fall where they may. One old rancher had a, had a young man that was working on his farm for the summer and he couldn't get these wild horses to come in and drink. And he was upset and frustrated and said, I just can't get him to drink. I can't get him to drink. And the old farmer said, wait a minute. You misunderstand. It's not your job to get him to drink. It's your job to make him thirsty. When we live our lives as God intends, we make people thirsty for that kind of blessed life that God promises. Will you live your life, kids, to make other people thirsty for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Will you do that? Be an example in speech. Same with me. In speech, in life, in love, in faith, in purity. You guys did a terrible job right then. Be an example in speech, in life, life, in love, love, in faith, faith, in purity. purity. One more time. Be an example in speech, speech, in life, life, in love, love, in faith, faith, in purity. purity. I hope you will, church. I hope you work on that this week. Let's pray together. Our Holy Father, you have given us each other. And we know that